Good morning, church family, and uh, thank you to those that have uh, led so far in this service. I am glad to be able to open God's Word with you again to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And while you turn there, I'll just make the observation that perhaps I should have done two sermons for each of these letters because there's just so much content, so many uh, rich connections with the Old Testament and even within the rest of of the book of Revelation. Uh, Glorious letters these are, uh, challenging and convicting and yet also full of hope and full of promise. So please do turn in your your Bibles to uh, Revelation 3. I'm going to read now and then pray and begin. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot, neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we would ask. As always, that our hearts would be found fertile uh, to the teaching, the preaching, the declaration of your word, that you would give us ears to hear, and minds that will understand, hearts that will uh, be feeling in the true sense of the word as a response to truth as your spirit leads us onwards into repentance and obedience. Give us, Lord, these graces for your name's sake. Amen. At the beginning of time, the clock struck one. Then dropped the dew, and the clock struck two. From the dew grew a tree, and the clock struck three. The tree made a door, and the clock struck four. Then man came alive, and the clock struck five. Count not. Waste not the hours on the clock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Those are the words of a former prisoner of war, a British officer named Eric Lomax, who during World War II had been tortured by the Japanese, had seen his friend suffer the same fate and die alone far from home. Probably it was this exposure to death, to the uncertainty and brevity of life, that motivated him to write this poem, one simply called The Clock of Man, the story of a ticking clock winding its way through history to an inevitable end. But while this picture of knocking at the door is a powerful image in the poem, and an obvious reference to this passage of scripture, it has been partially misunderstood if we think of it only in this way. Because the knocking at the door is not recorded here in Revelation as a suggestion to be mindful of how short life is, to enjoy life while you have it, in which case you could just as well become a Laodicean, eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is not what this letter is about. Nor is it even properly understood a a line for crusades or street evangelism, though doubtless many of us have, probably including myself, used it that way. Remember, rather, where this is said and to whom. It is not said to 
unbelievers in the world, calling them to become a part of the church. It said to believers in the church, calling us to disassociate from the world. Okay, can you see that? It is part of a letter written to, sent to, speaking to the church in Laodicea, and by extension to all the churches everywhere across time. It's said to us. So let's see it in its context. To the church in the city of Laodicea. Uh, this was a wealthy place to live. I, I won't draw parallels to rich neighborhoods of the world today, as tempting as that is, because then we might be tempted to think this uh, of this as a letter that doesn't really apply to most of the church. Uh, we must remember, though, that the level of comfort that existed in Laodicea Baptist Church fell short of most of ours in a modern world. We have greater ease of access to greater benefits on a far greater scale. And this, by the way, is not to become a point of guilt, as though it was something shameful or need of repentance. Rather, it's just an attitude uh, that uh, we must maintain that the right attitude on the receiving end of such graces, uh, the attitude of reception must be sanctified. We must respond uh, with thanksgiving and gratitude and, and worship and, and generosity and open-handed giving. So in this church, in this city rather, with wealth much like the suburbs of Cape Town or any other number of cities around the world, uh, was this church. And most of its members were getting by quite well too. Probably many of them were employed in one of those hallmark industries of Laodicea. It was a city famous for banking. Uh, the, the famous orator Cicero had visited the century earlier and cashed his letters of credit there, a sort of a primitive form of, of credit card. Uh, it was also a city famous for pharmaceutics, that is, uh, for the development of medicines. They made eye salves and ear ointments, such as were renowned all over the Roman world. And it was a city famous for clothing and textiles. There was a rich, desirable wool, dark and glossy, that came from the black sheep of that region and then spun into to clothing to be sold. It was a city with stadium, a vast theatre, Roman baths and long paved colonnaded streets. All round, wealth and materialism was the order of the day, so much so that in the aftermath of one of those earthquakes that we've heard about in the previous letters... The whole city refused imperial disaster relief funds. They boasted of being able to rebuild it themselves. Thank you very much. And all these things are details that Jesus alludes to in this letter. Just as he also alludes to the one great problem that affected them, the city that is. That is, its water supply. Most of the water in the region was not suitable for consumption, so they had to pipe it in from somewhere else from six miles away. The problem is that by the time it arrived across all those old aqueducts and through all the mains, the water was now warm to the taste. Uh, some of their neighboring cities had good water. You know, in Colossae, not far away, there was cold, refreshing mountain water, the sort that eases your thirst and discomfort on a hot day. In Hierapolis, another close city, were hot mineral springs, are having medicinal value for easing pain. But Laodicea, the wealthiest city of them all, could only offer water that was lukewarm, nauseating, tasteless, and tepid. And Jesus uses that imagery too, doesn't he, as he comes to this church? Which brings us now to the vision of Christ. He calls himself, there in verse 14, the Amen, the Amen. And the word Amen was never intended to be just a conclusion to a prayer, a sort of divinely sanctioned point of grammar. The word literally means, so be it. Or if used as an appeal, let it be so. But it's also used to convey a, a sort of an, an assurance of truth, like saying, it is so. Which is why dozens of times in the Gospels, uh, the word Amen is translated as truly or verily. Like when Jesus says, truly, truly, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 3. Amen, Amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. John 5, 24. Amen, Amen, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. 
John 10 verse 7. It is so, it is so. Amen, amen, truly, truly. And now the one who speaks to the church says that he is the Amen. And used in that way, Amen is found in only one other place in the Bible, in the Hebrew text of Isaiah 65, 16, where it reads literally, He who is blessed in the earth shall be blessed by the God of the Amen. Translated in English, the God of truth. The one whose witness is true. True and faithful. And that title, still verse 14, Faithful and True Witness, is one we've heard before. It's how Jesus is identified in chapter 1, verse 5, where he is called the Faithful Witness. It is then gloriously said of a martyred Christian, Antipas, in chapter 2, verse 13. Then once more of Jesus himself in chapter 19, verse 11. Here is the one who may be trusted to bear faithful witness to what is, to what was, and to what will be. And, verse 14, he is also called the beginning of God's creation, which might easily be misunderstood if you're not careful. He's not saying he was the first created thing, uh, the way ancient heretics like Arius suggested, or modern heretics like the Jehovah Witnesses still say, in which case Jesus would just be a creature, a thing. Uh, the whole of Scripture, though, stands against this viewpoint and makes it clear that Jesus is himself holy and truly God, that he is Jehovah. Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty eight. So, so what Revelation is saying here is that Jesus is the beginner of creation, the, the author, the originator, the active cause, the one who initiated it, the one who is himself the creator. And this references in other parts of scripture that speak about how by him and for him and through him all things have been made. And, and if you doubt this, you may be confident that what I'm telling you is the case because of how verse 14 ties together with chapter 1 of Revelation and anticipates the new creation. Think back to chapter 1 verse 5 where the term faithful witness is followed immediately by the term the firstborn of the dead. In other words, there is a sense in which the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the beginning of the new creation. Though he is himself eternal, the resurrection of his body on Easter Sunday was the first great act of the new beginning, hence the beginning of God's creation. And if you're still not convinced, remember Isaiah 65, 16, the blessing of the God of the Amen, who is also the God who is Jehovah. Remember that reference? You know what the very next verse is describing what exactly that blessing is? Isaiah 65 verse 17, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Do you see how this all ties together with verse 14 of Revelation 3? Jehovah Jesus Christ, the Amen, faithful and true, firstborn from the dead, who ushers in the beginning of the new creation as a blessing upon his people. And this now is how he comes to the church at Laodicea. They cannot see themselves for what they are, but Christ is a faithful witness and sees in truth. They think everything is fine, but they are in dire need of a recreation, a new beginning. And Christ is the one who can breathe life into their tepid faith. And everything he is going to say is, Truly, truly, amen, amen. So it is, so it shall be, let it be so, amen. And then he begins. And we'll do the next two points together because Jesus offers not one word of praise to this church, which means we have to move immediately to the problem. He says, I know your works. There's not just a problem with the temperature of the water in Laodicea. There's also a problem with the temperature of the church. They are neither hot nor cold. 
and Jesus longs that they would be either rather than what they are. So verse 16 and some of the strongest language ever spoken by God against a church, the Lord says, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I will vomit you out of my mouth is how some translations accurately capture the disgust of, of Christ with this state of the church in, in Laodicea. The Son of God finds Laodicea Baptist Church to be utterly nauseating. And in a moment he will explain why he says this and what the problem is. But, but first let me address a common misunderstanding before we go any further. Because often you will hear preachers or even commentators suggest something like this. There are churches that are hot, zealous, passionate, on fire for the Lord, and missions and full of enthusiasm about spiritual things, and there are churches that are cold, dead, dry, academic, inward-looking, mechanical, and r full of routine. But Laodicea was neither, and Jesus wishes they would just make up their mind and become one or the other, hot or cold, because he can't stand the half-hearted middle ground. Uh, right? You, you've heard something like that before, haven't you? Perhaps you even thought it as you read it. Two out of seven of the commentaries that I picked up thought this was what it meant. But it's not. We might use words like hot and cold in that way today. Sure, and, and we might legitimately use them that way, of course. But we mustn't make the mistake of carrying our metaphors into a letter 2,000 years old. We mustn't fall into the trap of reading Revelation through the lens of the 20th or the 21st century, remember? We have to ask what it meant to them as they received the letter. And besides, would Jesus really wish that a church would be cold and dead rather than lukewarm and showing at least some signs of life that might be spurred forward? If that's what these metaphors really meant, is that what Jesus would want? Of course not. That would be illogical. Now, what this means is explained by the historical context, remember? Cold water in Colossae, refreshing and quenching. Hot springs in Hierapolis, healing and comforting. Lukewarm water in Laodicea, making your lip curl and making you feel queasy. The point that Jesus is making is that this church at Laodicea served no good purpose. Neither refreshing and quenching, nor healing or comforting. Instead, they were good for nothing, we might say. And you can see why from the way Jesus now explains the metaphor in verse 17. The Son of God will split them out to something distasteful because they say they are rich, that they are prospered, and that they need nothing. But in actual fact, heaven's witness against them is that they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. What does Jesus mean by that? Well, Revelation often uses the words rich and wealthy at least five times uh, to describe those who have prospered by compromise with the culture by forsaking faithfulness here or there in order to know success. And that certainly referred to their personal finances. It would seem in Laodicea here where they are described as rich in a rich uh, city, that would make sense. It might also refer to their compromises as a church. Anything to see a growth in numbers, any accommodation to make themselves more appealing to the community, uh, something that Jesus finds nauseating. But then the meaning of these strong words of Jesus is also seen in, in, the, in that the words he uses echo the words of Hosea chapter 12, uh, verses 8 and 11. And there the context is of a proud nation, Israel, there called Ephraim, and the, a nation that has obtained prosperity through idolatrous compromise with the world around it. Israel boasts, she says, ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself and all my labors. They cannot find in me any iniquity or sin. But God condemns, saying, they shall come to nothing. A uh, very similar wording to Revelation 3, isn't it? Laodicea are proud of their achievements, boasting of richness and wealth and saying they, they need nothing, uh, while God is condemning them, saying they will come to nothing. 
Laid a seer, a seer exalts in their riches obtained through idolatrous compromise with the world at the expense of an overt Christian testimony. They've turned back their faithfulness because it's bad for business. Turn, turn back, turn down, dial back. They've chased um, their faithfulness, chases unbelievers away after all, and it makes Christians look strange. So, so, so let's just dumb everything down a bit. They've assimilated themselves with the culture. They've become innocuous and accommodating. They're they're sensitive to the wants of surrounding society. They are seeker sensitive, so much so that Christ's verdict is that they have ceased to be of any good for the kingdom. They look like everyone else around them now. They're no different. They don't stand out in any way as being distinctly Christian. Hence, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And just imagine saying this to a a banking pharmaceutical textile city with people who boast of riches, medicine, and clothing. He's striking directly at the heart of their boasting, at the source of their pride, at the grounds of all their confidence and security in life. If I paraphrase, the letter is saying to them something like this. You think you are rich? You think you're doing well? You think that because you have a stable career, good health, a lovely home and a desirable neighborhood, fashionable clothes, a smooth ride parked in the driveway and a bustling church full of people affirming all your decisions, you actually think that all this is a sign of God's favor. That God would never have bestowed such things upon you if he were not happy with your life and witness. But don't you see, you are as wretched as a rebel in the presence of a king. Your life of luxury is worthy of the pity of poor Christians who can see its plastic emptiness, for whom your idolatry is most obvious. And though you have so much, your self-centered living is a nauseating affront against God. Your whole life has become about the acquisition of things, and you barely know Christ. You are ready to pass him by. You say you need nothing because you are so overwhelmingly confident in your own strength and abilities. And you claim to see everything with clarity, to be wise and intellectual and discerning, because how else would you have hit the heights of success if you weren't? But you are spiritually blind, totally oblivious to the gaping God-sized absence to your living. And you are naked and exposed before his sight. He sees through all the boasting and pretense. He sees the famine of your faith and your true heart's desires. And because this is what you are, the Son of God will vomit you out of his mouth. That's to paraphrase. It is what Christ says to those who have so compromised their faith that they are good for nothing. That they are lukewarm, a word used elsewhere in ancient Greek literature to mean liquefied, becoming watery, lacking substance. And notice the danger. Notice that it is their wealth. It is their comfort. It is their first world ease that has contributed to their spiritual poverty. Now, that's not to say that wealth is itself evil. Money is not the root of all evil. Rather, the scriptures say it is the root of all kinds of evil. Money itself is neither good nor bad, only used for good or bad. And there are many examples of wealthy believers in the Bible doing good and honoring God. And there are many examples of God bestowing wealth for that purpose. Examples, not guarantees. But it is also very clear from the whole of Scripture that money and the things it can secure, like comfort, like ease, like an array of different types of recreation, might easily distract from our wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ. As Charles Purgeon used to say, there is no trial like prosperity. And this church in Laodicea has failed it. They've accommodated the world. They've become like the world. They desire the things of the world. And they have the world. But they do not have Christ. And so we come now to their, to their duty. And we see... 
that strong words are not necessarily unloving words. Because in the same letter that speaks so severely, there are some of the most intimate, most inviting, most earnest appeals that God has ever spoken to a church. He counsels them, buy from me gold, white clothes, I solve, invest in this, pursue this, desire this. Now understand, this is not a challenge to the doctrine of justification by faith. This is not Jesus saying that you buy salvation or earn salvation or secure it through religious activity. And no, this is Jesus Christ using the marketing language of commerce to reach the economic minds of his hearers. All day, every day, they are obsessed with income and expenditure, with banking news and rates and fluctuations, with the latest fabrics and fashions and discount sales, with medical research and counsels and development. And there is no condemnation for those professions in case that's what you're thinking. But Jesus says, look at me. Hear my counsel. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Bankers, hear of true riches. Merchants, hear of heaven's clothes. Doctors, hear of true healing. Where? From me. It's, what, it's like what Isaiah 55, 1 to 3 says. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without a price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. That, that, that's the appeal here. It's the appeal of Isaiah 55. Buy what is free by coming to me. It's an appeal that they would return to their first love, that they would return to the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves from death and hell and saves for heaven and glory, that they would return to those simple truths that they once knew and could recite so well. Come back to Christ. The gold refined by fire reminds of chapter 1, Christ standing in the place of refining fire. Also a picture of testing that produces purity and endurance that shows faith to be pure. Come, invest in this. The white robes remind us of chapter 1 also where Christ is seen to be having a robe, but also of Revelation 7 where the saints are dressed in white robes, symbolic of the righteousness that comes through faith. Yet it also stands in contrast with the dark clothing favoured by the people of Laodicea who relied on that black wool, remember? So it's a call to be different from the world around them to let their righteousness shine as they identify with Jesus Christ. Come, dress like this. And in the soul for their eyes, it reminds both of Christ's all-seeing eyes in chapter 1 and of their own patented medicine, that, that famous ointment, that famous salve. Now Jesus says, come, be healed, come, see clearly. In each case, the call is a simple and ancient call for them to come to Christ, to imitate Christ, so that they will not be Pitiable wretches playing pretend Christianity. And Jesus says all of this because of his great affection for the church. He makes it clear now that his words here and the threat of discipline later arise out of his eternal love. So he says, be, be zealous, be earnest, be sincere. Quit mucking around. Stop procrastinating. Repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And the tense of these verbs points to a present and continuing action. He is standing there right now knocking 
all the time. Can you hear him? It's not unlike the picture of Song of Songs 5-2, where the groom is knocking at the door of a hesitant bride. Christ knocking at the door of the church, knocking at the door of the Christian heart. And don't misunderstand this now. Don't, don't, don't miss this in, by becoming too technical or by misapplying it. This is not a threat to the doctrines of grace. This isn't God saying that at the end of the day, for Jesus Christ to do any work of grace in a person's life is entirely dependent upon the will of the sinner. Oh, we must not tear this out of context and weaponize it against those other texts of Scripture which make so plain that the sinner is helpless unless the Spirit first comes, brings life and faith, and moves them to respond. That's not the burden of this letter in Laodicea to, to comment on the doctrines of grace. What's more, and this is where the danger of misapplying it comes in, this isn't even said in the context of evangelism at all. Do you see that? Remember what I said at the beginning? Jesus is not standing at the door of the world knocking to be let in. Jesus is not standing at the door of the unbeliever's heart knocking politely to be allowed the opportunity to save them. This is not an evangelistic tract. It's not said to the world. It's not said in mission. It is said to the church. This is the Son of God coming to a church, a messed up church admittedly, but a church all the same, a church that is enraptured by the world, distracted by riches, compromising at some level to get on with the culture around them, trying to, dis trying to attract instead of proclaiming the truth, and to his beloved church, he says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. God is calling out to Christians, counseling Christians, telling Christians to repent of their indifference towards him, to repent of their idolatrous pursuit of the ideals of the culture around them and let him in. This is what Christ desires from the church. Not some far-hearted liturgical effort that has them singing but otherwise separate from daily communion with God. Not some semblance or form of religion that soothes the conscience once a week. But close communion with his people, with you. Now, now tell me, Goodwood Baptist Church, have you let him in? I'm not talking about conversion, still less about regeneration. I'm talking about the intimate, ongoing, heartfelt pursuit of Jesus Christ and your response to it as an expression of your personal worship in the secret places. And in the context of this letter, it is entirely appropriate to ask the question of Christians, have you let him in? Is what Christ is, is appealing, in a sense, by saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Have you let him in? Have you really? And could this be why Christians are so often overcome instead of overcoming? After all, this is the only way to defeat sin, to resist our unique temptations, to say no to ungodliness, to not be overcome by the culture, to resist conformity to the world, to endure persecution or slander from those in opposition. To repay good for evil, to live with a difficult spouse, to win over the lost, to not hate the bully, to put, de to, to de put to death the flesh, to love when hated, and to keep going. You, you try in your own strength, you are conquered. You sup with God, you fellowship with the Son, you conquer. How do you overcome, as all seven letters call Christians to do? You have to open the door. To repent of procrastination and hypocrisy that finds time for everything else but not him. To repent of the self-sufficiency that keeps you from the place of prayer. To repent of greed masquerading as life's goals. To repent of the famine of God's word. 
to repent of substitutes that offer themselves as shortcuts. Hear the knocking right now. Open the door and feast with the living God. And that brings us to the promises. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat or dine with him and he with me. Can you imagine a more wonderful thing? It's the same word used by Luke to speak of the Last Supper, likewise by Paul. Most properly understood, the meal here was the evening meal, the meal reserved for close family and dear friends, not a business lunch, not a quick takeaway or snack between appointments, but the meal where, as one commentator says, people lingered and shared their experiences and thoughts of the day. This is what Christ offers. The promise then is that for those who will hear the voice of Jesus calling to them, for those who will answer the call of the one who can breathe new life into their near-dead faith, he will reward them with a closeness, a companionship unlike they've ever known before. The word companion, by the way, comes from two Latin words meaning to come together and break bread or come together and bread hence the the term one who breaks bread with another and, and that is what jesus is promising here he will come to you and linger with you break bread with you he will bless his church with his presence they will walk with him as companion disciples Friends and brothers to the King. Isn't this the desire of your heart? If you are a Christian? I don't want some hollow substitute for great personal intimacy with Christ. I don't want some plastic alternative, some fabricated artificial emotional experience. I want this. I want to know Christ and be known by him. No amount of money, no level of church ministry sophistication, no excellence of music skill can produce what Christ offers here. This isn't about appearance. It's not about emotion. This is real. This is like being in the upper room with the Lord, the washing of the feet, the sharing of the, the, the food, the, the leaning on the breast of Jesus Christ. This is to love the Savior and be assured of his love for you. This is to recognize the great and eternal need of my heart is to worship my God. And the great and eternal mystery is that somehow he desires it from me, of all people. That he knocks and calls to his beloved church saying, open the door. Oh, this is such an amazing promise on the back of such severe words. Don't you want this? Don't you want a nearness to Christ such as can only come about through an authentic pursuit of his face? Can only come about by hearing, responding to him, fellowshipping with him in the secret places. To the one who does this, he says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Grant them, grant him or her sons or daughters of the most high God. They will be exalted one day with Christ, not as co-equals, for he is the eternal God and we will never become gods, but invested by him with authority over the new beginning, the new creation it's a bit like the story of narnia once again in which the sons of adam and the daughters of eve are each elevated to a throne with a crown they are co-regents together brothers and sisters kings and queens under the reign of mighty aslan this here in the book of revelation is a promise of unprecedented honor and authority bestowed by the king of kings upon those whom he loves. Jesus says that Christians who pursue him, seek first the kingdom in this world, 
shall have both in this world and all the more greatly in the world to come that very thing, fellowship with the king, a taste of the kingdom. And just as he himself conquered by going through trials and tribulations, through temptations and hardship by way of the cross and sat down with his father, so too now will those who follow him. We have to conquer. And to conquer means first to fight, to struggle, to resist. Not, not fight him, but to fight the, the tendency to become like the world. Jesus does not promise an easy ride. He, he promises a battle. He promises a war with a full range of human emotions and human experiences thrown into the mix. And after all, at the end of the day, as Revelation repeatedly reminds us, we have a great enemy, the devil. But through it all, Christ himself will linger with his people as they open the door. And with such promises... He says with Trinitarian completeness to the church in Laodicea, the church at Goodwood, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that is where the letter ends. So, so this is not a picture of a beggarly Christ pleading, pawing at the door to be let in like a stray cat caught in the rain. The one who stands knocking at the door is the ascendant Christ. He is the Lord and Savior and Judge and King. But to his people, he is also brother and friend. And to his wayward bride, he is a husband and lover, most earnest in his affection, sincere but not desperate, calling but not whining, inviting while commanding, and ready to bring discipline to those who are the object of his love. He calls to everyone in his church and he says, if you will open the door to true spiritual intimacy, he will come in and feast with you. The clock is ticking away. Tick, tick, tick. And Christ is knocking. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There is still time to put right what is lacking in a lukewarm faith. There is still time to be revitalized in your Christian walk. One day there won't be, but now there is. Time for him to bestow true spiritual riches upon you. Time for him to open your eyes. Time for him to clothe and awaken and bless you with his animating nearness. To empower you to walk before him with that inner joy that transcends all outer circumstances. There is still time. There is still opportunity. So I'm going to change the words of that poem that I read in the beginning. I'm going to direct them as they should be given to the Christian. Let them read as follows. At the beginning, faith begun. The clock struck one. At first it grew and the clock struck two. It changed with ease and the clock struck three. And wealth made poor and the clock struck four. But still Christ offers life, and the clock struck five. Count not, waste not, the hours on the clock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this simple and beautiful picture of Christ knocking at the door of the church and inviting us to feast in fellowship with him. Lord, you know what we are like. You know how easily we are distracted from the riches and the privileges that we have in Christ. 
how the things of the world cloud out the promises that we know. But we thank you, Father, that you have purposed by your word and by your spirit to remind us, to call to remembrance the things of your word, so that we might turn once again and feast with our Lord. Help us, Lord, to not be conformed to this world, but to be conformed, mind, body, soul, and affections to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour and our King. Amen.